Anyone who has read A Nation of Shopkeepers, or there have been some excellent reviews of it as well, will know that Dan is arguing that the left in the UK and elsewhere, at least in terms of electoral politics, has become the preserve not of the working class that founded them, but the new petty bourgeoisie. So one of his key examples is the thousands of downwardly mobile university graduates who are inspired by Jeremy Corbyn. Unfortunately, that's about as good as it gets on the left in what we read here, especially since the return with a vengeance of Blairites in the form of Starmerites. So those people, the professional managerial class, are also playing a key role in the left. Zero interest in redistribution and people who, as Dan says, view the working class with a sense of paternalism at best and terror and disgust at worst. So whichever version of the left we're going to be talking about, whether it's Corbyn, McDonald, Sultana, or Starmer, Reeves, Streeting, Dan's arguing that the working class see its priorities and its culture as having little relevance to the concerns of the left. So since the lumpen are who we're going to be talking about in the working class, I'm willing to bet, Dan, that you're going to say that the lumpen proletariat have pretty much zero engagement in this kind of left. So... Let's see what Dan has to say. All right, is it time for the lumpen proletariat definition? There's one in the back of your book. Yeah, shall I do it? Sure. Okay, so the definition of, the, just uh, to start, the, the definition of the lumpen proletariat that I provide in my book is the underclass. Uh, so a distinct fraction of the proletariat uh, defined by worklessness. Uh, Marx and Engels took a very dim view of this class, calling them social scum, uh, claiming that they were venal, uh, prone to criminality, and relatedly that they were very politically unreliable. Uh, and like the petty bourgeoisie, um, they were easy to manipulate uh, and could easily be turned towards uh, reactionary politics uh, by the bourgeoisie. Um, so that's the definition. Shall I... S that's, yeah, not a lot of love for them in uh, <laughs> Marx and Engels. And um, I wouldn't say things have necessarily improved. Um, but So what's the difference between the lumpen proletariat and the working class? And, and should we start using the term? I mean, it's fun to say, but should we be using it? Yeah, so um, well, both Dom and I, Dom's written about the lump, Dom's publishing uh, collective, I think it's called Lumpen. Dom's book is about the lumpen proletariat. My book is about the petty bourgeoisie. So both these classes are classes which in sort of traditional Marxism have been stigmatized. So Marx and Engels, and if you look back to a lot of early communist theory, they really don't like these classes at all. Um, and I've often felt um, that a lot of this was actually just like residual sort of aristocratic snobbery. And there's a recent uh, sort of uh, history of the British Communist Party by, or like h details his involvement in it by Ralph Samuel. And he sort of says, we backs up what I've always thought that terms like lump and proletariat and petty bourgeoisie were often used by sort of the left as a way of explaining away failures. So if we can't win people over, oh, they're lumpen. Oh, and if they don't agree with us, well, they're the petty bourgeoisie. Uh, you know, it, it's almost like a convenient way of rather than taking responsibility for the failure of the left, you can just say, well, actually, it's down to these classes being sort of individualist and politically unreliable. So, uh, just, just I should just say as well, I, I am hesitant about using the term lumpen proletariat. I'm hesitant about returning to the concept or engaging with the concept of the underclass. I don't know if people, but, but some of the reasons I think it's important before I get on to some detail. Did you see the question time clip the other day where the, the, the cleaning lady is basically saying, you know, why should I work because there's people... Who getting are everything getting free. everything for free. So this lady is presumably working a minimum wage, very difficult job, is nonetheless sort of furious at this perceived lazy underclass. And that's one of the big most important reasons we have to sort of engage with this is because the underclass, whether you want to call them the underclass or the lump of proletariat, are sort of a foil. Uh, and as I'll talk about later on, it's one of the reasons that the, the working class have been split. Um, and if there's been, I don't know if you've been, well, you all probably do watch the news, um, but there's been a, you know, a, a tragedy happened in, in Cardiff, um, where I live recently, where two young boys have been killed 
it's been alleged after being chased by the police. Um, and one of the most upsetting things about uh, when you read things like that about these tragedies, about 15, 16 year old kids losing their lives, if you read the comments, you know, I know you should never read the comments, especially if you're like an author, but if you read the comments on Twitter, people just say good. They're saying things like good, they're scum, you know, because they live in an Ely and that's a, a sort of depressed council estate. People, there's this real, um, real animosity towards this perceived underclass. Um, so I think, well, in terms of how it's all started, right? So, so Marx and Engels have always had, when they started talking about the working class, they always had this, there was always two sides. So you've got the lump and prolet, the lump and proletariat, this sort of criminal, um, unreliable, temporary workers, people who weren't working in uh, sort of industrial, you know, the indu in the factories, people who weren't organised. Um, and they used the lump and proletariat almost to define the proletariat, this ideal type of revolutionary individual, you know, this disciplined, collectivised worker who normally works in like a factory. So there's two sides of the same coin. You can't have this idea of the disciplined uh, agent of revolution in the industrial proletariat if you don't also have uh, this unreliable individualist sort of criminal class. Um, and, you know, so that, that's how it all started. And there were sort of two aspects to it. Uh, you can stop, stop me, feel free to stop me if I'm, if I'm rambling or, or going on a bit, but there was a technical definition of the, the, the lump and proletariat, and that was basically people who were in informal work, what we would call today like the precariat, you know, people who are in and out of work, in and out of the prison system, or even if, like Mark, Mark sort of alluded to, people who just weren't doing productive industrial work. Um, but then it also always had a moral aspect. You know, it was also always a moral judgment. People who had bad character, people who were sort of criminal. This is no different than Charles Booth's Blackest Streets, where he went from talking about levels of wealth down to the down to the very bottom, and then the moral judgments came in, semi vicious criminal. Um, so Marx and Engels were not the only ones who've who've applied this, obviously. No. Um, and and you know, you and Dom. Uh, in your books have both talked about the fact that there's a split, you know, this, the split yeah. still exists. Is it, I mean, I suppose in modern terms it benefits Britain and the people who've been um, told that they should despise them because like this carefully chosen woman on question time um, being weaponized to... Yeah, so there's always been, and this is what I think is quite interesting, there's always been a split in a way between the rough and the respectable within the working class. So if you've ever read the book Chavs by Owen Jones, which is in many ways a fantastic book, one of the problems I had with Chavs was it sort of implied that the people who were going to be having a go at Chavs were middle class people. Whereas in my experience, the majority of people who were having a go at Chavs were people who would themselves be often defined as Chavs, you know, it was, so it was a, a divide within the working class. And, and one of the things that I write about in in, in, in my book about the petty bourgeoisie is that one of the ways the petty bourgeoisie um, and people sort of define themselves was by, against this idea of the underclass. So it's used to define the class. But if you look at the, the actual British trade union movement, this idea of the skilled worker has always been there. This idea of the skilled worker versus the unskilled worker, it's always been key to sort of the formation of the formal proletariat. But in terms of how, the, where this has come in the modern day, it, it starts really, I think, with Thatcherism. Thatcherism, the idea of this, this the, is it the striver versus the skiver or the benefit scrounger or in, in uh, America, Nixon, was it Nixon or Reagan, this idea of like the welfare, uh, dependent. Welfare queen. The welfare queen. The, the very racist yeah, term. Yeah, the, the, the dependent. Uh, and that was, I think, when we started to see this, this enormous fracturing of the working class along uh, along the lines of um, you know, th using stigma and splitting the working class, um, but just before this, is, so I always struggle with like some technical things. I I feel like I have to sort of say them, otherwise I'll, I'll forget them. So um, I just sort of panically panicked, panically, panickedly, or uh, on the on the bus up was reading this article on the lump and proletariat by um, uh, an academic called Kathy Weeks, and it was it was amazing. Um, and basically what she sort of says is that, so in my, in my book, I argue that the, the class structure has now changed. So we're no longer in this 
uh, ideal type scenario where we've got a big industrial proletariat, like a small layer of uh, sort of managers and then a small layer of owners. In, in fact, the class structure has sort of gone back to what it was uh, immediately preceding the Industrial Revolution, because we obviously we've, we've deindustrialized, and the class structure is now way more complicated. The, the industrial or formal working class has shrunk, and what Cathy Week says is that you know we've also got a massive rise in the self-employed, so a rise in the petty bourgeoisie, but we've also got a massive rise in people doing informal, low-paid, precarious work. So obviously, you might be familiar with Guy Standing's work, The Precariat. Well, but what uh, Cathy Week says quite convincingly, I think, is more and more people today, more and more people actually fit the sort of technical definition of what Marx would call the lump and proletariat. You know, we don't have people doing these formal... People don't work in factories, you know, they don't work down the mines in trade union, in unionised jobs. They work in... The, the peop more and more people are living on the margins between paid employment and unemployment, a massive rise in people claiming uh, different forms of benefits. So basically, the lump, the, the, this idea of the lumpen is relevant because this, this category has massively grown. Well, one question. You argue in the book that a lot of people you would define as part of the new petty bourgeoisie because they're self-employed, sometimes the bogus portfolio careers, the zero hours contracts, that there's been a huge rise because of certain government incentives. So you're saying they belong in the petty bourgeoisie, um, even if it's working part-time at a call center and maybe being a yoga instructor or something. Um, but what you're saying about Kathy Weeks is that arguably those people are part of the lumpen proletariat. Or does it make a difference if you're a delivery rider versus trying to start your yoga teaching career? I think I think it's both. I think it's both. I think you know that there's a rise of um, a massive rise in sort of bogus self-employment, um, and maybe the way out of that is to look at um, what Eric Olin Wright. So he always talks about this idea that class is no longer like fixed. We don't have you're the proletariat, you know, you're the petty bourgeoisie, you know, you're the lumpen proletariat. Increasingly, as this sort of class structure becomes a lot more chaotic and fluid, and people are moving between, between jobs all the time, the class boundaries are sort of permeable, and people no longer have like a fixed class over the course of their life, and they will change, you know, they'll change classes. So I think what's happening realistically is just a, a, a blurring of boundaries, you know, people are moving between, um, because life has got, so, I mean, for example, self-employment in the UK um, is extremely high. It's also highest in countries like Greece um, and Chile, countries which have been most hollowed out by neoliberalism. It's, it's lowest in countries like, you know, no surprise, Germany, the Scandinavian countries, countries which still have sort of the uh, relatively strong welfare states because there's no incentive in those countries to become bogus self-employed because why would you if you have a decent decent job you know one of the reasons people become self-employed one of the reasons people have you know a, a moving between classes and moving between uh these crazy work situations is because everywhere is terrible you know you, you have a terrible job and then you think well maybe if i set up you know my own small business things will be fine i know certainly i have that i mean Mably, my girlfriend has got to live with me in my, my madcap schemes every day. Like, I, I hate my job. I want to set up this business or I'll become a car salesman or, or something like that. But, but more and more people, as their lives are getting worse and, and paid employment has been hauled out, you go, well, I'll do this. I'll be self-employed. Then you realize, oh, that's terrible as well. So then you go back and people are going back and forth. Um, so I think it's, it's fluid. Mm -hmm. that's, a bit, yeah. <laughs> that's a bit of a cop okay. out. <laughs> no, not at all. When we talk about the lump and proletariat, the word stigma is, you know, one step behind, right? And you're talking about the respectable working class being encouraged to look down on the people on benefits and look at her. She doesn't keep her house clean. And, you know, that's, that's not a recent thing. That was my mum's generation as well who scrubbed their front step. Um, and in A Nation of Shopkeepers, you talk about how um, the petty uh, bourgeoisie uh, take great, um, set great store in defining themselves as against the working class. Not even the lumpen proletariat, but that's Chavi, I won't do that. Look at my new build house and so on. So is it not just that 
in this class system, we are all taught to despise the people below us. And if you're at the very bottom, at least you're not a refugee. Is that, uh, I mean, I I is it any different? But, well, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the, one of the, so I've just uh, reread uh, Mike Savage's, you know, the, the Great British Class Survey. And obviously the conclusion to the Great British Class Survey is rather than identifying um, sort of strongly with a class at the moment, most people in the UK tend to, there's a, a, an unfortunate tendency to just, you know what, you, you, you don't identify with a class, but you certainly know what you're not. You know, so uh, class disgust is really prevalent and, and disgust, uh, as Bourdieu says, is really central to, to sort of defining, defining your own class. As you said there, Karen, it's, it, ge geography is a huge, and housing is a massive class divide. Uh, and it's one of the, um, I mean, because obviously, London, you see a lot of sort of council estates, and if you've read Getting By by Lisa McKenzie and in Chav Solidarity, you can't get away from this idea that there's, you know, the, the stigma is bound up in where you live and the type of places you live and um, the type of house you have. Um, and I, I've got a passage in my book where I talk about how council housing, and it was a shock to me, you know, council housing used to be the preserve of the respectable, respectable. <laughs> the respectable working class, which when I was researching, I was like, well, that's, you know, that's just bonkers because, um, you know, certainly where I grew up, the council estate was such a demonized sort of place. And then uh, you read the history of what happened in council housing and there's a, the gradual restriction of council houses, the gradual restriction of council houses toward, uh, and it, they're only reserved for people with the most intense social problems. And then this, mo this, this, um, this mass movement of uh, the respectable working class out of the estates and then gradually what once was a, you know the preserve of the respectable working class becomes the preserve of the underclass and and today this idea of the lumpen proletariat is inextricably you know linked to council, council estates uh, and all the things and all the things that come with respectability vis-a-vis -vis housing you know like do you put your bins out on time um you know and obviously and these things are massive if, uh, the, the, the how the, in terms of policy it's just enormous if you look at the Blair, blair's the troubled family discourse that was all about you know this idea of problem families on estates um ruining the ruining things for everyone um and, and obviously, labour have, labor have returned to that. They've returned to this. Yeah, the, the, the law and order, disc, the law and order discourse that is, that is seeping back into uh, British politics is sort of hang 'em and flog 'em, um, and all the other horrific things that are being uh, uh, talked about. You, that can't be done without this foil of the lumpen proletariat with this uh, this folk demon of the underclass. And it's all about you know your or the you're ruining our peace and quiet or you're riding scramblers around the estate and um and so on and so forth so the the geography of it is is really really important and um speaking of geography you've written about lumpen geography um in the context of wales and foreign development investment so lumpen geography a new term to me but i think we can all get what that means it's a place where labor is cheap and basically everyone is lumpen proletariat by virtue of where they are. Would that be fair? Yeah, so um, I wrote, a, there's a guy called Richard Walker, who's an American uh, geographer, and he wrote, writes about, wrote, he writes about this idea of the lumpen, the lumpen geography. So, you know, within the world system, this like mosaic of all the different countries, there are certain parts of the UK, like the Southeast typically, which uh, companies go to invest because it's a high skilled sort of workforce. But what he argues is actually uh, places like South Wales and North of England and politicians are always saying, oh, you know, I can't believe, you know, why do jobs keep leaving and jobs keep coming in and they're low paid and low skilled, what we call a, a branch plant economy. Um, what Richard Walker argues is that this is called a, l a lumpen geography. So global capital sort of needs countries which are desperate, you know, places of people who are in and out of secure, in and out of uh, insecure, low paid, low skilled jobs. Um, so if you want to bring like an Amazon factory or, or like a, a massive other plant there, then the people there are absolutely desperate. Ted Tedville is your place. Yeah, yeah so people are, yeah, people are absolutely desperate. So the, the concept of the lump and geography actually, you know, uh, it's, about it's about precarity, it's about precarity. And it, it, I guess it forces us to think about the global aspect because when we think about the, the lump and this concept of the lump and proletariat, 
and this is a, a problem of class in general, we do tend to individualize it and think, oh, look, well, I'm not saying I engage in sort of demonization or like um, stigma or anything like that, but a lot of it is bound up with individual bodies, isn't it? And clothes and uh, and single mums and, and, and all this other horrible stuff. But it's important to realize that it's, it is a global phenomenon. It is a sort of structural phenomenon. Uh, and it's not just about, you know, people's accents or people you don't like, you know? Yeah. On that subject, Imogen Tyler's work on stigma is really important. She's recently put out a podcast, five episodes on the, and of course she's based in the north too um one of the talking points um that we wanted to get on dan was that you know obviously both you and dom essentially are talking about and defending classes that have been seen as reactionary we've already heard what marx and engels thought and um and then there's the historical Marxist arguments about fascism, that it was just, it didn't have anything to do with the king, his wife, and the elites of British society who were so keen, or, or the Daily Mail in the UK. But basically, fascism was a problem of the lumpen proletariat and the petty bourgeoisie creating it all themselves. Um, uh, but, but Dom's argument, you know, in reclaiming the term lumpen, um, uh, is that the lumpen proletariat are a potentially revolutionary force. The Black Panthers uh, thought that as well. And Dan, um, the takeaway from A Nation of Shopkeepers is um, the petty bourgeoisie are a potentially revolutionary force as well. I assume you mean beyond door knocking in 2019. Um, so tell us then, how are they not reactionary? Um, it's a hard sell uh, saying that uh, the petty bourgeoisie are potentially revolutionary, um, and it's quite unfortunate that they formed like the backbone of like fascism uh, and <laughs> and Thatcherism. <laughs> uh, but you know, history <laughs> history tells us that you know that they are you know that they they can go left or right. You know, Trotsky is very adamant on this. You know, he says that the reason the petty bourgeoisie don't go for the left or socialism is because it, the the left are weak. And he says the petty bourgeoisie is sort of drawn to fascism because fascism, despite being hollow, the rhetoric is nonetheless about, you know, we'll tear down big capital, we'll tear down uh, the sort of status quo and the establishment. And we're sort of seeing that again. The Trump in, in playbook. The, yeah, and we're, and we're seeing that again, you know. It's, uh, it's undeniable that the, the modern right are peeling people off precisely because they're using anti-establishment language. And that you've got to ask, you know, why isn't the left harnessing people's anger, you know? Um, and obviously, if you look around the world, you know, the petty bourgeoisie were the, they weren't just the, the sort of the base of sort of Trumpism and, and Thatcherism and fascism. They've all, they were also the basis of Chartism, you know, early socialism, Owenite socialism, uh, sort of third world uh, movements around South America and Africa were led by the sort of petty bourgeoisie. So in terms of the lumpen proletariat, um, yeah, Dom makes a compelling case that they are a potentially revolutionary agent. A lot of this stuff... Um, it all comes back for me to this this divide between the unreliable petty bourgeoisie, you know, the unreliable uh, lumpen proletariat versus the always reliable and always revolutionary, you know, disciplined proletariat. Um, and this, this Kathy Weeks article was great because it's sort of, um, it's basically saying that this is an illusion. You know, you're talking about uh, the petty, you're talking about the, um, the proletarian in in the out this figure in the abstract you're talking about this idea that this is just people just have this in these innate revolutionary qualities um, but if you dig down into why you know marx uh thinks that the working class are revolutionary you know it's always implicitly about collectivism and their experience of sort of doing collective industrial work makes them disciplined brings them together in trade unions and then sort of inexorably you become conscious of your class position and your class interest and then you become uh, a revolutionary subject and you sort of overthrow capitalism because you've got nothing else to lose that's the that's the proletariat but what uh, weeks and dom and everyone's arguing is that actually to argue that being disciplined by work and the sort of work relation um isn't actually that much of a reliable indicator that you're going to be a revolutionary and and, and and Weeks and Don both argue that it's this lack of respectability uh, that the, the lumpen proletariat have, this refusal almost to... It's precisely what Marx said was their weakness, so not being involved in full-time sort of collective work, but she says is a, is a strength. You know, the, the fact that people don't want to work, the fact that people aren't engaged in, um, 
in uh, collective work uh, and are um, and maybe I'll get onto these factors, but um, factors, factors. Um, you know, it's, these, these things are strengths. You know, these things are, these things are strengths, and people are willing to. Um, and Dom is quite interesting. He argues that the the London riots in two thousand eleven constituted a, a lumpen proletariat uprising. You know, he says it wasn't uh, what we would call a traditional you know, for, or maybe coherent form of sort of socialist organising, but it was nonetheless uh, a, a form of political protest. Um, and, you know, the, the task, I guess, is always to ha how can we harness these things. And the young petty bourgeoisie went and swept the streets to show what good citizens they were. Um, one of the things you and Dom both talk about is chaos, people having deeply chaotic politics that are often all over the place, um, that don't work in the ideological horoscope that many of us <laughs> want to use. So, and, and Dom talks about that with, with real solidarity and, and empathy and understanding in chap solidarity, as you might expect. Um, but there's also a sense of frustration that the left doesn't appreciate that people are complex and expects us all to have fully formed, perfect, consistent, coherent politics. And it's quite annoying when people don't, when you've got your program. So, I mean, do you see any relevance to the current political situation? Yeah, I mean, when I moan about the left, obviously people in this room excluded. It's not us, it's this the left, it's this everyone else. But th this idea of... Um, this idea of chaos, I think, is, is massively key. When I said about the, the class structure is sort of returned to pre-industrial period where it was sort of made up of semi-proletarians, artisans, sort of, you know, uh, vagabonds or whatever, that period came with massively chaotic politics. You know, people had, um, uh, you know, chauvinistic tendencies, deeply chauvinistic tendencies, but also, like, very sort of radical tendencies. Um, and the, the example I always give when sort of trying to explain... Uh, the modern, the, the chaos of the modern uh, petty bourgeoisie. I mean, apart from using my friends who have like just deeply, deeply chaotic politics, and you know, on the one hand, very chauvinistic politics about like the nation, and on the other hand, they'll just casually say, yeah, you know, we should just storm, storm Westminster and kill everyone. But and you're like, and you know, and then they're, you know, that I, I, I believe them when they say, it, you know, um, is that, uh, and, and I don't know if you know about Tom. Do you, do you follow follow Tom Skinner? Tom Skinner, you know, the guy who eats breakfast, like massive breakfasts, and just says like Bosch all the time. I love Tom Skinner. But um, but Tom Skinner, um, when Just Stop Oil were protesting, Tom Skinner was one of the guys who was like on GB News, and he was like, uh, you know, berating this Just Stop Oil protest. Uh, you stop me getting to work. Uh, I'm not going to do the accent, but he says, you stop me getting to work, you know, you're, you're an idiot, things like that. And then people said, whoa, this guy's really reactionary. And then a few weeks later on, like, Joe.ie or whatever, the Joe, the politics show, they asked Tom Skinner about, you know, what do you think about politics? He's like, I don't care about politics. But then just obviously goes off on his pretty perfect, is, uh, you know, we should have, you know, get rid of big business, uh, help working people, uh, sort of real empathy, save the NHS. And people were shocked, you know, how can you have this sort of chaotic politics? And obviously, you know, the, the, the answer is well. One, um, you know, it's we're living in under conditions of neoliberalism. You know, people do have deeply chaotic politics because most people aren't in trade unions, so there's not much like political education. There aren't people aren't members in the. They're not part of these collective things which are, are telling you, oh, this is this is perfect. That's perfect. People are consuming sort of right wing media and stuff all day. So it's it's ridiculous for us to sort of expect this fully formed, perfectly, uh, you know, perfect person with perfect politics because obviously we've all got perfect perfect politics and no prejudices and things like that um but the the best example at the moment on a um i guess a, a political a, a political level is the the gilet jaunes or the the you know the yellow vests um because when the the yellow vest came out you know people were like who are the who are these guys because they were saying things like you know we hate immigrants um, but then, you know, we're going to smash the state and, you know, no more taxes. And people, you could see, like, the French left, like, you know, who are, who are you? Because their politics were absolutely all over the place. And it was totally chaotic. And you're seeing that in, like, the trucker protests in Canada, uh, the fuel protests in the UK, the farmer protests across the Netherlands. Um, you know, and, and it's very interesting because there's obviously a form of politics that particularly the petty bourgeoisie and sort of lump and proletariat are engaging in, which is very alien for us on the left because, you know, they're not respectable. They don't do marches uh, and sort of, 
talks and things like that. They, you know, they just go, I'll just go and smash the place up and drive my tractor into the center of town and spread manure everywhere. Um, and it's just, it, it's, it's totally chaotic. Um, but what has happened at the moment in France is that the, the trade unions in France, after sort of, I think, being a bit scared of the, the yellow vest, have started to link up with the yellow vest. And they've started to talk about the gilet jaunification of the French unions. There's, you know, the, the, the French have overcome this idea that oh, like, they can't ally with these people because they're nuts, you know, um, because they're sort of re reactionary. And they've started to build this, um, what I would call an alliance between the working class and, and the petty bourgeoisie. And one of the key things that's happened about that is the revolution or uprising or, or intermittent uprisings in France have spread beyond the city. And that's a, m a massive issue, isn't it? Because like in the UK, um, the left or and in France are concentrated in cities. And then we wonder, you know, why, why is the far right growing in rural areas? And it's because well, well, no, no, le no young lefties live there. You know, they, I don't know if you saw the, um, the, the, the attack on the asylum hotel in, in Knowlesley, outside Liverpool. Well, everyone was going, organise, you know, why won't someone organise in these places? And it's like, you've got to live there first. You've got to actually live in these places rather than living in, in London or Manchester or Liverpool. And, 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 you know, and the far right and, the, and sort of and elements of the petty bourgeoisie, obviously, they, live, they still live in small towns. They still live in small towns. Uh, and, and, and by linking up, um, with sort of lumber proletariat and by the petty bourgeoisie, um, you actually will move. You know, you'll move out of cities, and, and that's how you build a true class line. I, I, I definitely wasn't what the question was, but um, that, well, <laughs> that's my solution. Anyway, <laughs> well, that, that was maybe the end. But right. let's talk about the state. Of course, we've been um, sort of hanging on that, and and Chav Solidarity talks about it from the perspective of the people who get prodded and poked by institutions, uh, often well-meaning ones like teachers and servants, the NHS, um, um, all the things that um, Blairite labor like to talk about, you know, when they weren't committing war crimes, they started Sure Start. But if you talk to people in the underclass about their experience of Sure Start, it's very different from what you hear presented at seminars at the LSE, where we were helping the chavs. In fact, the experience of people of that, of, of women being told what to do by their betters was no different than, you know, health visitors 100 years ago. Um, so, that, so that hatred of the state is very well founded, or at least the people who are coming to check that you don't have a boyfriend. Um, and um, Dan, you're talking about small business people's hatred of the state, bureaucracy, meddling rules, low traffic networks, um, <laughs> and all those kinds of things. So, I mean, I think uh, hopefully we can all see that some regulation might actually be a good thing. Um, should we, if, if, if I accept that the lumpen proletariat have valid disagreements with state control, do I have to extend that to the white van guy who's like, ah, <laughs> let all the kids on Blackstock Road die? <laughs> um, the, I think we do have a, a big, a, there's a big problem in, in the UK, uh, I, I do think about the, the state and understanding why people don't like maybe the, the left and why people sort of went for Thatcherism. Because if you, if you, you know, Stuart Hall said in the, I think it was the 70s or, or maybe the early 80s, you know, he said that, you know, uncomfortable as it is to admit, you know, Thatcher's critique of the welfare state, people people went for it. People really agreed. People agreed with it, and it was almost impossible for people to, you know, maybe in the in the Labour Party, um, to understand. Um, and as Dom, you know, writes in his book, and as if you work with, uh, as I have been working with, I guess for, f for five years, the lumpen proletariat, you know, the homeless, the people who are adjacent to the homeless, um, people who have uh, you know, been re recently released from prison, there is a deep, deep hatred of of the state and the state bureaucracy because the lumpen proletariat are basically a subject. You know, they're a problem to be policed, to be managed, and uh, whether it's through mass incarceration, which is the, the norm, or, or being policed in other ways through the benefit system, you know, and, and to a lesser extent, things like the social services, social work at the NHS. There's always someone sort of prodding you, poking you, telling you that this is what's going to this is what's going to happen. Um, and then when you know the left have sort of fetishized that welfare state, and when the left are sort of comprised in the main of people who work in the public sector, who work in the welfare state, you know, in, as social workers or as, um, 
uh, probation workers or what we call you know the lefty caring professions and things like that, teachers, health professionals. You know, it almost becomes uh, an epistemic problem of people just not understanding why. Why can't you understand? We're trying, you know. But um, you know, I was talking to Danny Dolan before, and he said, you know, he was at a, a Corbyn rally, and he spoke to someone, and it was. And he said, "What's this all about then?" And the guy said, "It's about helping the poor." I got to give you a correction point on that. That oh, was a right wing oh, okay. CLP, oh, okay. uh, not a not a Corbynite. Oh, right. I fact checked that. Um, but this idea of helping the poor, you know, we got to help the poor. We got to help. There's still a sort of degree of paternalism there. There's sort of a degree of paternalism, and I think there's. There's almost people can't understand why people don't like this idea of the welfare state, and that obviously poses a massive problem going forward. If we want to, you know, because most of us want to rebuild the welfare state, so how do we square that circle? In terms of the petty bourgeoisie, um, it is a bit more complicated because a lot of people I know, like my friends who own small businesses, just you know, they they don't like any form of regulation. You know, there's um there's a massive libertarianism, um, which has almost gone under the radar, I think, in the UK in terms of our historiography and our understanding of the national character, particularly because our understanding of the national character or um is based on collectivism. If we're thinking about like the left and the Labour Party, but it's almost glossed over the fact that there has been a mass. There is a libertarianism that is sort of alive and well in the UK and people do hate regulation and I think but in a way it's comforting because you know I think people are worried about having this confrontation up with um, you know I think there's almost this fear of the working class or fear of the petty which is your fear of the lump of proletariat and and the left are sort of scared that well how can we have these conversations because these people are react you know there's the implicit the, the underlying thing is these people are reactionary you know how are we going to sort of break how are we going to talk to them? How are we going to build alliances if these people have got reactionary politics? But it, that, for me, is not the issue at all. The issue is that they, people just don't like the state. They, increasingly, they don't like being told what to do. And if we are going to have a successful left movement, we have to work out ways of, of speaking to people which, uh, and engaging with people and, and policies which don't replicate this sort of paternalism. Um, because I really think, you know, that, that it's, it's that the issue of the state is... Um, is is why people don't uh, and unfortunately that the left is increasingly just associated with the state it's associated with is associated with the state and that's a massive problem obviously anyone who's had um experience of campaigning on the left as an activist whether it's in electoral politics or otherwise has to deal with that fear of like i'm going to talk to someone who disagrees i'm not sure how i can counter it and before you know it, you're Gordon Brown going that bigoted woman. Um, uh, but <laughs> which, um, how do? You, how about you? You've knocked on doors for various people when um, uh, you know doing frontline work. When you are working with people who have had everything taken away from them or never had it, and are saying. Yes, and if you're a refugee, you come over and you get given everything, you get given a council house. Um, how do you confront it? Yeah, so, um, well, Dom, Dom has a great bit in his book because he, he sort of talks about growing up in um, in, a, in a very deprived part of Nottingham in a council estate and how he basically, from a very young age, was socialised into sort of racism. And the book is great because it's about him sort of owning it and sort of saying, yeah, I had bad opinions, but I'm I'm working through them. Um, and one of the interesting things is, because um, you know, I work with the homeless for, for years, and every morning you get some form of, you'd have to diffuse some form of uh, quite nasty racial uh, tension, either between the, the white uh, homeless in Cardiff who make up the majority, moaning about Ro uh, Romani or Romanians who are, perceived to not be properly homeless, or uh, your refugees or Ukrainians who are being housed ahead of us. Um, there has to be a realization, um, I think, you know, it, this goes back to this issue of um, you know people not having perfect politics and people having you know, so chaotic lives um, and having chaotic politics, is that people down at the bottom, you know, down in precarious, uh, really precarious situations, um, People are already at the end of their tether, and there's an enormous amount of uh, anger. Um, and when you when you see, you know, it was it was a fact in Cardiff, for example, that uh, two new hotels were being handed over to Ukrainians. So we were there as the frontline workers, getting this in the neck, blah blah blah. Why is this happening? Why is that happening? All this xenophobia. And 
but I could see why it was. I could see why it was happening because there was a there was such a scramble. There's such a scramble for resources, and what Dom's um, book is so good at talking about is because everything's been cut to the bone, because there is no housing, because you can't see a doctor, because you can't. Um, you know, because mental health services have been cut to the cut to the bone, and because if you if you, you engage if you do any research into the asylum system, you know there's sort of like a, a dumping system where people are, are basically moved to place the parts of the UK where housing is the the cheapest. So if you read Getting By by Lisa McKenzie, people are dumped in St Anne's in uh, in Nottingham. You know they're dumped in council estates in, in Wrexham. They're dumped in council estates in Middlesbrough, in Cardiff. The refugee system and this sort of dis uh, dispersal system is basically almost designed to create racism, to foster term, racism, to, and, and, and it's been and, proved and, and, that yeah. and turn people against one another. And Daniel Trillin had an article in the Guardian about it the other day, where it was brilliant, and he just said, you know, the, the, you know, people aren't racist. You know, they're they're not racist, but like the 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 way this, for example, the, you know, the asylum system has been structured. It makes it almost inevitable, you know, because you're splitting off the poorest, poorest people. Um, and so in terms of how you deal with people who have chaotic politics, you know, I was, um, you know, you do sometimes get in a, in, an argu in arguments with people in, the, in you know, seven o'clock in the morning in Cardiff City Centre, and people give you, you know, why is that bloke in a Cardiff Council shirt just like having a screaming match with this, this homeless guy? Um, but there is a way of, you know, there are a way of doing it, you know, I, and, and the thing is, is that people... I, I, I think sometimes a lot of people don't appreciate, again, not us, but other people on the left, don't appreciate you know, just how angry and just how angry people are at the system and just how shit people's lives are and just how desperate people are. And they're a lot angrier, you know, cause, so a lot of, you know, a lot of people on the left, a lot of people who sort of vote for Corbyn, I argued they're sort of, you know, the new petty bourgeoisie, people are downwardly mobile. So, you know, I've experienced downward social mobility, you know, yeah, I did my PhD, then I was working back in a bar and I, you know, boo-hoo and I'm so upset because I'm not fulfilling my potential because I was, you know, patted on the head in school and told I was smart and things like that. But, you know, people have, you know, people at the, at the very bottom, you know, the lumpen proletariat, you know, the, the, the working class have been, you know, because my situation pissed me off. Imagine how awful it is for people who have you know, their entire life just been, you know, just shot on time and time and time again. It's just an anger and a, and a deep resentment um, that's being built up. And, and you, you, you have to talk to people in ways that are respectful and understanding that people are angry and people don't, you know, and, and people do have chaotic politics. I mean, one of the, I mean, race is a, is a, is such a thorny issue in the UK and, and on the left, I think, because people, I, I do think that there is a tendency, and obviously this might be a controversial opinion, but some of the discourses seems to imply that people are just innately racist, you know, people are genetically racist. I, I, dis, I disagree, you know, I think a lot of people, um, are not, you know, racist. That they are very, they're just very angry and frustrated, and then that is turned into racism. Um, I think this idea that there's this like, innate racism is like disem is disempowering, and it's almost how can you work with people if you think that they're inev they're always going to be racist, you know? Um, whereas in fact they may have been given the only social sanction they get, which is to be racist to to people. Um, w it's almost time for us to turn to our extremely clever and well-informed audience for piercing questions for Dan about this book and about Dom's work. Um, and just a reminder, you've all been told, we're going to the People's Museum, which is literally two minutes around the corner. It's a fantastic place. There will be drinks. There's still some sunshine. So we hope you'll come along. It's a great institution and lovely people. And unlike the People's Museum in Manchester, doesn't have a lot of pictures of Tony Blair in it. Um, uh, so, um, hopefully, at least some. <laughs> oh, there. Can I, I do have one more. One more point. Is that, um, you, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was going to go on to. Oh. Um, um, do, do you want to give me your your favorite one out of the talking points here? Because oh. I was going to talk about social mobility and the relevance in the book, but you do you. Oh, I, so. I talked. I talked about race uh, then, which is always something that makes me uncomfortable um, because I think it has become something that's uncomfortable in the UK. Um, and again, I'm talking about this Kathy Weeks. I should have just printed out the Kathy Weeks article and like waved it around. Um, Be a test it, later. It's, it, but it's it, it's it's, re it's really really good. But um, if we're talking about sort of uh, Kathy Weeks said, what are the things that def split the working class off from the lumpen proletariat? And the question is really, what are the things which split off? the sort of traditional or stable working class from the precarious 
work class. So what what are the f the what are the sort of vectors, the factors that make people sort of ultra exploited and ultra poor? Um, and she she says there's there's four vectors. So one is race, and in particular sort of the ref people who come through the refugee system. If you've got no recourse to public funds, if you've got no uh, you know if no right to remain or whatever, and if you're here working I illegally, then you are inevitably forced into working in in the informal economy. So by um, and obviously, other people who uh, people of colour or uh, people who aren't white are excluded from the labour force because of structural racism. So race is one vector that sort of creates the sort of uh, the, the modern urban proletariat. Uh, the other one is criminalisation. So criminalisation is enormous. So um, you know, we jail. There's like eighty to ninety thousand people in the in jail in the in the UK. It's by far and away. The biggest, uh, you know, we jail the most people in in Western Europe. It's basically just like mini mini America, you know. It's just a it's just a we jail an insane amount of people, um, and as well as the stigma of sort of being jailed, you know, having a criminal record excludes you from the formal. Uh, the labour market, you know, you're not going to be a, a teacher or a nurse or whatever, if you, or generally things like that, um, or, or a host of other sort of respectable jobs if you've got a criminal record. So the, the, criminal, the criminalisation of a massive amount of the population serves to, you know, to further define this sort of lumpen aspect. Um, the third is gender. So obviously the, a lot of the stigma about the lumpen proletariat is about single mums, you know, single mothers, and because uh, obviously women are excluded from the formal economy because of childcare, so they're more uh, likely to do sort of informal, sort of low-paid uh, care roles. And, and the final one is about uh, disability. So you know, there's a, always a narrative of like hard-working people, and um, which sort of forgets that you know a lot of people people can't work, and you know, people are on benefits because because they can't work. Um, I think there's like one and a half million people on PIP at the moment. So those are the just just to flesh out a bit you know what so with it, you know to to understand within the population what are the things that make people sort of ultra uh, poor or ultra exploited or in that lumpen aspect she says those are the sort of four things so you get a picture you get a picture then of like who are these you know who is the modern lumpen proletariat well it's more likely to be non white it's more likely to be disabled you know it's more they're more likely to be uh uh female um and then more, you know, more likely to have like a, be involved in the criminal justice system. Almost as though it isn't just pure moral failings or but being born to an. Oh yeah, or you're just a scumbag. <laughs> you know, that's uh, um, as people would. But but you know, you, you see those na the, the narrative is, is um, it's widespread. You know, it's widespread. Disgust, class disgust, is widespread, um, and it's it's a, it's a massive problem. You know. So it's almost time um, for all of you to ask Dan some questions. And if you haven't yet got a copy of this book, I know this looks like product placement, but really, really um, get stuck in. And of course, if you don't already have Chav Solidarity, also excellent. And Lumpen, the magazine. We don't have any copies in the shop at the moment, uh, but it's available digitally and you can find that at the Classwork Project. Um, happy to send a microphone anyone's way. Go ahead, ask. Yeah. Don't, yeah, don't all come forward at once, like, uh. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, this is actually a question more about like Chav Solidarity. Um, I recently finished reading the book and um, I'm sure maybe both of you can think about answering this question. Um, it was a bit more directed at Dom, but... So he talks about being involved in a bunch of leftist movements or this kind of thing, and there were some good ones and there were some less good ones. And I just don't, again, maybe I, maybe I read it too fast, but I didn't kind of get an idea of where could you be involved from a level of, you know, not being an external, like, you know, the middle class, working with working class and not really understanding their experiences, where can you find a place or what are, what are like examples of where I can go reading a bit more of being involved in leftist movements where you feel like you could have a bit of a change, even on a local level, I'm not, change can mean many things. I wonder if anyone yeah, has thought about this, even in the audience, if anyone's read Chive Solidarity, of, yeah, what are some example movements? Thanks. 
Do you want to go, Karen? Or I, anyone answer it? I think we heard an example of, of where not to. We were talking about um, food banks earlier. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes it's easier to find negative examples. What yeah. You, what, um, were you working with any homeless activists, or did you encounter them in Cardiff? Uh, um, so I, m the confession is I, I've tried to stop being involved in like left activism um, because I hated it. Um, and I hated it for the same reason that Dom, Dom did. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was a trade union rep uh, for five, no, four, four years. Um, and what I used to do disciplinary, like support workers in disciplinaries in the day. And I remember distinctly giving a discipline, uh, not giving a disciplinary, uh, helping someone out in a disciplinary. And you're in the way the manager sort of spoke to this worker and spoke to me, you know, like just like pieces of dirt off their shoe. And then I remember. I cycled across town to this meeting and I was spoken to in exactly the same way by the same class of people that had just been speaking to me like dirt in our meeting. Um, and I thought, like, you know, imagine, imagine I brought my mate here. Imagine I brought one of my mates who's not political and just brought them into this meeting and got spoken to, spoken down to. Um, so I've sort of, uh, I've sort of moved away. But, uh, but what I do do, and I am still involved in, I, I recommend everyone, is to just get involved in the workplace trade union, you know, the trade union movement, because the problem with, act it's not a problem with activism, but one of the issues is, I mean, there's a, my mate was doing an interview with Tyrone O'Sullivan, which is a, was a famous miners leader in, in South Wales. Um, and Tyrone, you know, he said, oh, well, you, you know, you're really political back then. And Tyrone O'Sullivan said, well, you know, what do you mean political? And he was like, you know, you're into politics. And he said, well, not really, like we weren't into, didn't read about the you know the news like the news about politics or we went into activism as we would understand activism because their lives as miners and their lives in the as you activists as trade unionists in the NUM were innately political and so their daily lives and making the workplace safer and fighting against the the boss was that 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 was politics to them and what's happened really since with the with the the sort of death, effectively, of the trade union movement, the left has moved away from the workplace. Um, and I think that's a massive, a massive problem. Because if you, the thing, and go and, if you're on strike or if you're on a picket line, um, not only does it have, you know, develops class consciousness, it's a massive leveler. You know, you don't fall out with people, you don't bicker if you're on a picket line with one another. Generally, you know, you shouldn't be really talking about divisive, um, sort of, you know, culture war issues, because everyone, if you're in the workplace, the thing that most people have in common is trying to make their working conditions better. So I always, I always advocate for people, you know, like, and, and the thing is, activism is tiring. Like, if you do a job and then you go out and you, you know, and you have to do activism, like, on top of it, it's, it's knackering. The problem is, obviously, is the majority of workplaces in the UK are not currently organized you know i think it's over 90 percent of the people in the private sector aren't in the union um so you know tenant you know it, but it's, it's it's that's me there fetishizing you know the industrial worker you know and like uh, and there is a right way you know that the industrial sort of the proletariat but you know tenants organizations uh, like acorn and things like that they're all doing fantastic fantastic work um but yeah i mean Dom's book is a it's a fantastic overview of like the the sort of goods and the bads and um, but I would I would always say like the workplace for me is the best place um, to put to put your energies into you know. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good, good. Okay, so where does that leave lump and proletariat people, people who aren't in the workplace? Yeah. So no. So. Um, well, again, I'll uh, I'll again refer you, Josie, to the the Kathy Weeks uh, article. Spoiler: uh, I hated it. I hated it. Uh, um, but the good but the good thing I thought about the Kathy Weeks one is that he said, you know, if you're looking at the and the, the sort of the disorganised aspects of the working class, yes, yeah, so if you if you're looking at uh, people who are in sort of unorganised sectors, if you're looking at people who have been involved in the criminal justice system, you know, experience of homelessness, things like that, it necessarily forces you outside the traditional trade union movement because you know, for, for, you know not just because of practi practicality you know, the practicalities of organizing people who aren't in work is quite is, is difficult so you have to have new ways of doing it and the, one of the failures of the union movement is it never kept up with um the people who are disorganized and in fact if you go back through the history of the union movement um 
you know, there's always been like union leaders who basically just said, those those workers are just, you can't organize them. You just can't organize them. But then lo and behold, every time someone says that, then there is like a wildcat strike where people do come together outside the official uh, trade union movement. Um, so you know, you you have to you do have to we have to we have to be creative, don't we? Like we have to uh, work out new forms of new forms of organisation, whether it be tenants organisations, whether it be um, organisations for ex prisoners, um, and have to have some way, maybe you know, possibly like some form of party um, <laughs> that brings people you know, that brings people to get brings people together. But um, and then what do we do about? Um is it the Rosa Luxemburg thing, Tom, about the left creating its own bourgeoisie? Mm. Or about the importation of well-meaning posh people who then take over the leadership roles and manage the rest of us? Big problem. Um, no, so I, so one of the reasons I was optimistic, I'm not optimistic anymore, um, but one of the reasons I was you know, optimistic about the recent strike wave is because what's really happened is you've had, you know, under the, the remnants of the organised working class in the UK, which is the RMT, and the CWU, unfortunately, the CWU have been essentially sold out, I would say, at the moment by a, a, a terrible deal they've been told to accept by the CWU leadership. Um, but you know, th those those movements were they were in they were leading it. They were leading, you know, and they were the vanguard of this movement. And then the white collar unions, PCS, UCU, the nurses, the doctors were sort of falling falling in behind. Um, so th that was an example for me of what things, in theory. You know, should look like, and then I thought the next step should have been the the union leadership trying to link up with these petty bourgeois movements, like the you know the, the fuel protests and uh, and things like that. Um, and obviously, it didn't it didn't work out. But in terms of yeah, this idea that like the left always creates its own bureaucracy and the the trade union leadership, and well, we're seeing it at the moment. You know, the trade union bureaucracy just taking terrible deals, and you know. I'm sort of doing my day job at the moment is researching, you know, striking postmen, which is why I'm wearing shorts. Um, but um, you know, the, the people are just scratching their heads. They don't understand, you know, how can we be so militant? How can we be so solid? And then there's something the bureaucracy gets in the room, and they always come out with a terrible deal, and no one really un and no one really understands. But it's a it's an intractable historical problem. I don't like because, and it's happening with UCU in a way, you know, um, not the world's worst union, but um, but what. They're up there at the moment, I think. But um, but no. But in terms, but in terms of you know, you, you you do wonder what what is happening with the trade union bureaucracy uh, and what are they doing in the room. So, yeah, I don't know. Let's Um, so just off the back of that really quickly, I'm actually a PCS member who's been out on strike several times over the past few months. Um, I think. To an extent, I do agree with that, but I also would counter that by saying, in my experience, I've found the FDA to be the union of the petty bourgeois, like fast streamers that come through, you'll try and leaflet on the door in the morning and they'll go, oh no, sorry, I'm a member of FDA. And I'll think, well, what are they doing for you? What have they ever done for you? But anyway, I digress. Um, my question was, how would you categorize precarious workers like Uber drivers or delivery drivers who are actively organizing and unionizing in their workplace because it seems like I, don't know, I was trying to find an overlap in what you were saying between these two kind of classes and wondering where that that category would fall in because you know they're obviously technically part of the precariat which would be the underclass but then there's still that drive for for advancement and and class consciousness at the same time so in the book, I categorize them as uh, occupying a gray area between uh, like the working class and the petty bourgeoisie, and um, when I said I went to Athens uh, for a conference, and I said that the de delivery drivers w could potentially be considered as the petty bourgeoisie, and people uh, didn't go down well. Uh, um, but what I wanted to do in the book was to move class away from like a moral category. So you know, p I was people getting really really pissed off. Like, well, I'm you know, I'm not I'm a delivery driver, I'm not a petty bourgeoisie, and I was trying to say, well, it, it it's not about like an attitude or being like a selfish person. It, if it just means that you own your own means of production. It just means you own your own means of production. That was the only thing. And obviously, the issue is: does owning a mountain bike, does owning a, a taxi, you know, constitute as legitimate means of production? And I'm not not precious either way. I was just trying to. 
the reason I was trying to use a category of the petty was he was to try to say, well, that's a slightly different working on your own in isolated environments, sort of on your mountain bike, or um, in a, as a taxi driver, or or a, any of the other types of jobs in the gig economy. I was just trying to say it's a different social experience from this traditional experience of working collectively, and it's that. You know, traditionally, this idea of working on your own was seen to produce a particular individualist, sort of rugged, individual, sort of competitive mindset. And there's there's been a lot of good examples in the UK of delivery drivers successfully organising. Um, but there's a lot of sort of more depressing studies in Australia where people were looking at strategies of resistance amongst delivery drivers. And what the strategies of resistance sort of end up doing were like, I'll chip my bike so I can get, do more deliveries and take more deliveries off my mates and things like that so they were saying it was a almost an indi- it was a form of resistance which sort of ended up serving the needs of of capital but i would say anyway to uh, the short answer is i would say it's it's, it's a gray area but the good thing about the the delivery um uh, strikes and things i thought was it was just like josie was saying we need new you know these are these are conditions where people would have said you can't organize those people and i'm sure that the big trade unions would have looked at those types of work and thought, there's just no point. Um, just, just as was said with the match women, as was said with the Grunwick yeah. strike, as was said with... Yeah, and, and then, but then they went ahead and successfully organised anyway. So it's proof that it, you know, it can be done. Yep. Hi there. Yeah, thanks for your um, book. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, I just wanted to hone in a bit more for a second on what you were talking about when you talk about the left. Um, because I think... When I read books on the left, if you like, the most um, inspiring, exciting, and practically sort of productive in terms of left practices are on, on those margins that you've talked about, you know, in terms of books by post-colonial theories, books by disability studies, books by about abolitionism, et cetera, et cetera, rather than books by, you know, new left review authors or, or et cetera. Um, so, I'm wondering, and that's not a new thing, you know, that's been for 50 years that those other authors, those other activists on the left have been marginalised. So what, I'm wondering whether why we need to keep focusing on, if you like, the dominant form of the left, rather than those lefts that are probably much more productive to, to try and bring to the cen- to se- bring to the centre more in terms of where we, where we, whoever we is, where we're trying to get to and where we're trying to go. Um, because surely the dominant left is still reproducing a lot of the exclusions and the and gatekeeping and all the sorts of issues that we you know we're not interested in. Um, so why do we keep wanting to sort of resurrect them? Um, yeah. So what I would say, I, I totally agree. And one of the things I found most jarring about writing the book and publishing it, and you have to negotiate a field, you know, what Bourdieu would say is a field, and there are some people with a lot of cultural capital, there are some people with a lot of clout, there are some people with, you know, very little clout, like I thought I had a lot of clout, but, um, and obviously it's great people came out, but you realise that, you know, you're just like a, a small fish and, and, your, and your opinions aren't really often taken seriously, and you read some amazing articles and amazing bits of work, and you think, why isn't this, why isn't this selling, like, why isn't this... Uh, this person got all these like followers on Twitter, or why isn't this person being asked to do this column or that column or or X, Y, and Z? And you, and you you do wonder, don't you? Like um, these voices from the margins keep being. Um, why do they stay marginal? Um, you know, like I spoke to Paul O'Connell about this the other day, and, and you know, and a cynic a cynic would say that there's almost the the left as it still exists is almost like a cause you, all throughout history. There's been the left has had a, you know a workers movement. And then, sort of an intellectual component, which was at its best, was sort of organic intellectuals who were actually part of the movement, or but generally were people who were sort of intellectual and sort of grafted onto the movement. But they, they sort of nonetheless had a relationship. I think what's happened now is that the the head or whatever has been separated from the body, and you've got like a, a left, which is essentially just just an intellectual. Uh, like a cartel is the wrong, it's the wrong word. I can't, I can't really think of a word for it. But like, you know, it's just a, it's a group of very educated people almost talk, talking to themselves, and within um, that group, as you said, it's always it's always been the case that a lot of the best or most famous British Marxists have always been from the top public schools. Um, and Mike Davis wrote that article, but when he did, when he went to work in the New Left Review, he found it 
you know, he found it very jarring because he was like a working class American guy and he said there was all these norms and um, sort of c civility and that he found quite uh, quite upsetting. Um, but the task, as you said, how would you bring all these marginal... Saying, I'd, I'd love to write for New Left Review if anyone... <laughs> Is, I, re I really, I really would. <laughs> but, um, but like, um, how would you bring the task? Is how would you bring these marginal perspectives into the, not into the mainstream, but how do you get them, sort of like uplift them and, and boost them? And, and when we haven't got the, well, you know, Dom's obviously trying with lump and um, people are sort of trying, but it's, yeah, it's it's, it's a tough one. That you, know, you could argue possibly the Labour Party has a, has a particular function. In that, you know, you you could uh, you could argue that the, if the Labour Party w wasn't there, then um, the field would be a bit more sort of equal and level leveled. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, it's an intractable, it's an intract it's an intractable problem. Obviously, if you've written a book, you're like you want to sort of, especially a book that sort of slagged everyone off as I have, and then and then you want to you want people <laughs> you want to get invited onto things. You have to be quite. Uh, Quite careful and, and 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 smart about negotiating the field, but yes, it. it I totally agree, basically. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I really appreciate you bringing Stuart Hall in because, as you were speaking, I was sort of thinking about how Stuart Hall talks about how during the Thatcher years, the right was really good at remaking this idea of common sense, um, and I was sort of wondering if the left has to sort of attend to the chaos politics of people and all the different contradictions there, how do we also formulate a new version of common sense that can create the sort of like mass, like cultural conviction that these ideas are not actually fringe and are like intrinsically right? Yeah, no, that's a great question. A lot of it always is, the, there's a thorny subject in it because um, if you're saying oh, people have chaotic politics, meet people where they are, you know, how do you stop becoming basically like a really right wing, right like blue Labour or something? You know, just saying like, yeah, well, listen, people are nationalistic. Let's just say the nation is awesome. Like, you know, the British Army are amazing and, and things like that. And it, no, but it's a it's a really it's an intractable problem because look, you know, how do you um, you have to on the one hand accept that people have chaotic politics and people are sort of here, um, and then if you want to, how do you forge a common sense without also sort of uh, fetishizing or getting sucked into some of the more reactionary tendencies so but the the key with um you know creating a new a new common sense is is obviously to be part of the move i think just to be part of a movement you know to be to be you have to be you know if you want to win people over and you want to sort of create a new common sense you want to talk to people and create like a new synthesis you know of um you take it you because know, i do think i said about the anger there is a lot of anger and there's a lot of potential um you know we always it can be very depressing talking about like the left and socialism because you often feel like oh there's we're, we've we've been beaten or whatever and in some ways like the the organized left has been beaten but it doesn't mean that um you know if you speak to striking workers and if you hang out with you know mostly normal people people do still have quite a k intense class consciousness and sort of good politics they still ever you know there's the paradox that everyone in the UK um, wants nationalised services, or they want all these policies, but then they they all vote conservative. And one of the, one of the explanations of that is people just people just don't like like the left or like lefties or whatever. Um, that's an obvious way of interpreting that. But to, to build a new common sense, like you have you have to be part of the you have to be part of the the movement. I think, and that is. It's a problem at the moment because the left just aren't. If we talk, you know, who the left is, it's um, the left isn't really where people are. So, um, but it, it comes back to that problem: how do you build a new common sense which also has all these progressive elements and doesn't have uh, reactionary elements? Because most, I, you know, the good thing about Stuart Hall um, when he talks ideology, he says ideology is like composite. You know, it contains all these different strands, and you like articulate like Thatcherism, for example. You know, had all these chaotic elements. Thatcherism wasn't just one bit; it was like nationalism. It was also, uh, you know, saying get rich quick. It was also saying you know, there's like these scumbags who are on benefits and things like that. So you're sort of chaining all these different aspects to it. So the left have to work out what are the the aspects and how do you bring them all together. I am basically I just I don't know is you know, <laughs> is is the short answer, but yeah, no. Uh, 
Um, all right, Dan. All right, Jan. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on larger workplaces where there's lots of different unions, um, where at one point you would have been able to strike in solidarity with each other, and actually now, I, you know, I come back from a background of working in education, schools and universities, huge workplaces with like a million different unions in them that at one point could have taken quite, you know, forward action against, um, you know, whatever's going on. Where do you think we can go now in terms of uniting those? We can't really change the law with this government and probably the next one coming in too. I think there's a bit of a blind spot here where actually getting trade unions together in a workplace in a maybe more informal way has, has got a got got a bit of legs to it. You got any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's it's a it's a constant problem. If you look at you know striking in a university at the moment, uh, there's obviously five unions involved, um, and then you've got you know UCU, and then all the support and professional staff are in Unite or GMB, um, and then obviously you have all these instances of of the big unions kicking off at each other because they're poaching members and and things like that. Um, and you know, the, at the current postal workers strike, um, this is a bit of a mad example, but um, the management and supervisory workers are in a separate union, uh, which is affiliated to Unite. Um, they have been paid like golden handshakes, or is that what we call it? Golden, like they have been given financial incentives to go into work and break the strike, whilst being mem paid at members of Unite. So there's a dispute between CWU and Unite. Why are you allowing, you know? Um, and you know, Tyrone O'Sullivan has this thing, you know, the NUM were obviously famous, you know, the, the miners always went, that, he said one of the reasons the miners were so, so effective as trade unionists, because they did loads of work to try to get the above ground unions, you know, the people who worked in the clerical uh, aspects, uh, coal trimmers, I can't, I don't know all the, what the, the roles were above ground or whatever, but they did loads and loads of work to try to ensure that the different unions that weren't in the NUM allied to them and didn't cross the picket line. And like, I don't see why that wasn't, you know, for example, in the, in the, if you look at any university as a big, you know, why aren't there um, the unions talking to each other and making sure that people go out in solidarity and things like that. On a local level, you know, they used to be just committees on a, you know, you'd have a, uh, a committee bringing together all the different unions, um, but you're right. I think it is it is a it is a big blind spot, um, and people and as you have you know you have schools in Wales at the moment where half the teachers are on strike and half of them aren't um, because they're in different unions and, and so on, um, and that's something for the union leadership at a national level to get together because it would be ideal I think in in UC in the universe in the, in the university if everyone was in UCU. Because you know, like the other unions aren't for, for really doing much for professional support staff, and it would be perfect if everyone was in the same union. But yeah, I don't know. Mate. We've got time for one more question, right in the center there. And as the microphone is going over, just a reminder that we're going to be going around the corner. If you want to join us uh, for a drink, stand in the sunshine, a look at a pearly king's outfit, and some fantastic history uh, from the Osselston estate. And don't forget that, uh, assuming Dan doesn't give up um, thinking about the left for a full-on life as a surfer, he'll be joining us on the 10th of June and again on the, toward the end of the month, on the 28th. Yeah, so I really hope some of you will come back. There is a lot more to say. And um, the last question down the front. Thanks. Just following on from what that um, comrade at the back said, how do you think it's kind of a big question i suppose how do you think we could potentially maneuver or work around the legislation in place that stops us striking in solidarity because obviously in, in my workplace we've got three major unions the leadership are not in a position where they're coordinating between the three so we've had to find ourselves crossing you know prospect or fda picket lines because pcs aren't out on strike but you know, obviously there are ways around that in that you could, you know, dual card or, or triple card, but it's not, it, that's not a, an easy solution. So what, what are your thoughts around, around that? Yeah, like you can only, I always think you can only go out if you, you know, if your union is called a strike, you can't be expected to go out in solidarity. Like, for example, in our building where we've been on a strike, you've got all the support staff going in, they're in Unite and 
GMB and they said, well, we just haven't met the threshold. You don't expect them to come out and break the law and, and lose their job, things like that. It's not realistic. Um, but there's a, a the broader issue is about the anti-trade union legislation. Um, and this has led to the sort of bind, and I, this is in one, you know, the, the one way I do have a lot of sympathy with a lot of the top trade union uh, uh, officials at the moment is is about affiliation to the Labour Party because you can see why you'd want to affiliate to the Labour Party because then if they get in well then you can say well let's overturn this legislation uh, and if you're not affiliating then you haven't got any leverage and, you, and until that legislation is overturned and there's two ways the legislation can be overturned one is mass mass civil disobedience in the UK and the other one is obviously just it gets done by like a left Labour government through the courts, but obviously the Blair government didn't undo any of the um, uh, the early anti-trade union stuff that Thatcher and Major brought in, and then obviously it's just got progressively worse. So I realise I haven't answered like adequately any of these like strategy questions, um, but you know I'm. Yeah, that. Yeah, um, well, we've had so many people just cross our picket line who just, you know, they'll say, good on you, like, you know, hope you win. And then they're not in a, you realise they're academics and they just think the union is, like, abstract. Um, but, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, I know that uh, I think Counterfire did a, uh, a good uh, sort of release about UCU when the, the uni union is basically a lockout with the, docking 100% pay for the marking boycott that we're doing at the moment. Um, they suggested that, you know, for example, the CWU could stop delivering mail to universities. Um, obviously, donate to strike fund is always a, is always a reliable one. Um, I was reading about the history of the um, the postal workers strike in 19 in the 80s, one of the first, when the CWU started becoming a militant union, uh, and there was a lot of resentment back then because they thought that the unions could have done a lot more uh, to sort of yeah, I think there was the electrical engineer, uh, the electrical engineers at the time. They said they could have, people could have come out in solidarity or done something to help. Um, but this is about thinking creatively, isn't it? It's about think new ways of doing politics and th new ways of what are the what are the weak points, what are the forms of leverage, um, and beyond donating to strike funds um, and doing. You the thing is, we you should be able to do things in solidarity with other workers. You know, when the posties were, the posties were out, the rail workers were out. Um, but it, it, you know, don't beat yourself. Don't. It's not. We can't beat ourselves up by this because it's not our. It's not our responsibility. We can think about it, but ultimately, you know, the rank and file will have to, uh, the the leadership will have to think of creative ways as well. But the important thing is that you know, the union movement has renewed itself like time and time again. You know, it, it's you've built new unions in the past and new strategies in the past, and we're going to have to do so again. I think, um, and in some ways. This idea of defeat or like you know the unions being picked off is shouldn't be like depressing because you should we should see it as an opportunity to just all right blank slate we'll start again you know we'll start again build new structures um, learn the lessons and so on um, yeah or just by people you know do the shrug when you walk past like I'm sorry um, I've done that a lot but um, yeah I hope that doesn't uh, probably doesn't answer me but um, th thanks so much for coming everyone I really have had um, a lovely, lovely time, and I hope you come. We'll have a pint now, as in, um, in the where? in the People's Museum. I've been told about a million times. Thank yeah. You